right, so we got one more guest hey in the group, which is awesome. Hi, Stefan. Um, before we kick off the session, and we're happy to uh, uh, engage in a discussion with you, let me just quickly introduce uh, why we brought you into this discussion. So uh, one of the topics we want to dive into is like what we call like synthetic or like automatedly generated content, digital content. And we've seen that like in our roles, what we see in the ecosystem, tremendously rising over the past years. And like uh, we all like we all seen like digital creative content, mainly in the form of like written formats. And we're all kind of like used to it. Like so when you get like automatically generated messages, totally, we're totally um, used to getting that, but there are new boundaries to break. And I think um, that's where you guys from Fintesia uh, are currently stepping in. And um, so um, maybe before we dive into the topic, maybe we want to be challenging you on the pros and cons and risks and, and opportunities. Stefan, a uh, quick uh, word to you and a word for an introduction uh, for what are you doing with Synthesia? Yeah, thank you so much, guys, for, for having me. It has been a pleasure to working with you so far. My name is Stefan, and I'm one of the co-founders of Synthesia. And what we do is that we transform the video creation process from a very much a physical process today into a much more digitized process, right? And uh, it will, goes without saying that we live in a video first world. We see like the rise of platforms like TikTok, which is a video only medium, which is the fastest growing kind of social platform, which is only video, right? But today there's a big gap between how much video companies can do and how much they want to do just because of the time and budget to kind of create videos today. And we transform that into a digital process, leveraging kind of state-of-the-art AI solutions to kind of perform these tasks, which has typically been required by a camera and a film crew and all these kind of things. Cool. Like, so pretty what, actually what you're doing, right, is like to create, like to have a solution to put words into people's mouths that they, they were not really saying in a way. Uh, so, um, add, add anything you want to add on to that, or maybe uh, what, what's the potential um, risk that you see in this approach? That, that, that is typically not how we pitch it, but uh, you, you could kind of say that, but it's kind of leveraging and kind of dig creating digital humans, which has been possible in Hollywood for the last 20 years of creating like digital characters. So you just don't have to spend, you know, two years to create like 10 minutes of, of content on screen. We leverage kind of state of the art artificial intelligence to create kind of digital humans that you can kind of program, you can kind of scale them up and make them say things and kind of just have like human interaction. So, so doing that much easier than what has been possible today and taking like what has been possible for the last 20 years with a huge budget and making that into a much more kind of scalable and cost efficient solution for companies to communicate with a human avatar to their employees and their customers and their stakeholders. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds interesting, but I mean, we also know deep fake is it's not an entirely new technology. We've uh, even talked about it uh, in last year's conference. Actually, so um, with that, you can obviously <clears throat> do some funny things where you put words into the mouths of, uh, say, even prominent people uh, who might not be aware of it. So there's some, there's an ethical debate going on uh, about this sort of synth synthetic media <clears throat> and voice dubbing where you just really don't see as a human, typically don't see the, the difference. And so they can be used for quite some of uh, mischievous uh, actions. How, how do you see these? Uh, um, these issues, these ethical questions, and, and what can you do to, to handle them? So from the start of the beginning of the company, we have always known that this is a very kind of controversial technology. And that's why we have from early on partnered, been like an active advocate to kind of take the ethical high road on this technology, collaborating with partners such as the big tech companies. So we're working with Google, Microsoft, all the people who's trying to kind of build the kind of save internet for, for users. But we're also working with academics. So one of our professors, one of our co-founders has built the best technology to detect kind of manipulated pixels, which allows you to kind of identify if it's, video, if, it's, if it's video is fake or not. We're also working with media organizations like BBC, Reuters, to kind of how to roll out this technology in a safe way. 
And I think it's really like a thing of the past of like taking the, we are just a platform role, which we've seen with the big social media giants that have just said, we are just a tool, people are using it how they want, where we want to have a much more kind of active stance and kind of have a much more kind of ethical kind of approach to this because we we definitely recognize that also having good actors you don't want like a, a windowless russian basement where these technologies are kind of developed you want kind of good actors who interact with the community and help them and have like the best people with kind of ethical approach to kind of develop these technologies rather than the hackers so, but let's just dive a bit deeper into that because so you're saying that you're in, in exchange with maybe some of the clients that you have for which you for whom you produce these uh, the sort of material uh, and by doing that sort of exchange kind of sharing the the responsibility right as I understood you don't want to give away this responsibility saying okay to your client here take the video and, and you're responsible for what happens with it but you want to kind of be in the same boat how exactly does that look I mean how can you make sure that your clients don't misuse uh, these materials, for example? So, so kind of just practically, we have like very strong control how the synthesia technology is not going to be used for bad. It's kind of very manual process to kind of do like content on our platform. We have human and machine moderation of all the content. We have a rigorous onboarding process of the organizations and understanding their use case and, and what are they kind of leveraging the videos for. That's one thing, but like in a bigger perspective, how like synthetic video is potentially kind of creating discourse in, 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 in like the society, we are playing our part to help out media organizations, tech platforms to understand this technology and how we can think about kind of long term solutions to kind of making sure we have a safe Internet where we can still trust kind of the things but I don't believe that it's so easy to just kind of detect if a video is fake or not, that kind of binary thing. Because if you look at like Snapchat filters and all the images on the internet, 99% of all the images on the internet has been, has been manipulated in one way or the other. So I don't think that kind of binary signal will kind of give you the, the short-term answer. So we're thinking about like media provenance and fingerprinting and these kind of things that is more kind of uh, long-term solutions to this problem. But maybe it's definitely, maybe let's put the, the question marks aside for the moment and let, let's assume you have it under control. I mean, there's still a risk that we, we, we're taking, but can you maybe elaborate a bit more why your technology really, in a way, helps consumers, helps companies, helps the society to like do new stuff that has not been possible before? Can you elaborate on some of the use cases and the potential? I mean, in the end, you always have to uh, balance potential versus the risk and the risk of regulating some stuff. That might be something that you were already implying. And maybe you could be sharing some of the, maybe some projects that you're currently working on with like, with like uh, making it um, a bit more uh, graphical for you, what you're doing. Yeah, for sure. So when you transform a medium from a physical into a digital process, it kind of enables magic things, right? You can think of it like, when the internet came around, you will start to kind of communicate with email, you will not send letters anymore, you will actually kind of kind of scale up your communications. The same with image creation and other creative disciplines. Now you can see like an amateur kind of music creator, he can actually create a top charting hit. He doesn't need to go to a $10 million LA recording studio to kind of be able to create like a top hitting chart, right? And when you start to kind of democratize video production, where we start with these kind of presenter style content pieces to camera, then we're starting to see very interesting things such as visual chatbots. So allowing to get like Siri and Alexa face right now, that is a purely audio interface, but we as humans has always gravitated to more and more interactive forms of medium. And just like humans, we are hardwired to understand, decode and transform information from other human beings because we are like humans and all the ways of mediums today, they try to, the best way is obviously a one-to-one -one conversation in a room, but we're trying to mimic that and, and kind of bring that gap down with digital technologies like ours. And um, some of the customers examples is like Tesco, who's kind of communicating with all their continental Europe offices and temporary workers who doesn't have any company equipment. So they send out 
Latvian, and Polish, and Czech, and uh, French to all the employees. And it's a personalized message that is relevant for them, right? So traditionally, video has been this one-to-many medium. But now when you transform it into a digital process, you can start to actually make it one-to-one -one, um, and also in many languages, which is obviously increasing the engagement and the, um, the interaction with the content. Okay, amazing. Any mm -hmm. like more like, okay, let's, um, let's, come, let's like employ maybe one follow-up question. Maybe some stuff you can share, like your, it's a media solution, it's about employee communication. What do you think is like the ultimate benefit of, of society? Like, better feelings, more natural communication, or what, what is it that you're, you're maybe also you're selling your solution uh, to your clients? What is it? So we just see that video is by far the best medium to kind of communicate, retain information, uh, just the retention of knowledge from a video versus text is much higher. Um, so we just see organizations wants to communicate way more with video for their clients, for their employees, for their stakeholders. And another dimension of that is that you can also make it personalized. So as I mentioned before, that traditional video is very much like, hey, random person in their organization, when if you receive an email, even from the CEO, it will still be like with your first name, it will still have some relevant information to your department. And we see that video as a medium can become as kind of tailored to the audience as text. And that is just driving much more kind of connection to the organization, much higher, deeper relationship between the organization and the, um, and the customers. And we see just that we are in the very, very early, early end of this. And we just see this can potentially become like a much more kind of building stronger foundations and relationship between organizations and customers, because you can actually scale that one-to-one -one kind of interaction now with, with these digital mediums. Awesome. Thanks for that. Hmm. Interesting. So um, I have another question regarding risks. I'm going to play the, the bad cop here. So there, there's already some, some activities or some platforms are actually thinking about how they can, how they can detect, um, I'll say fake material, fake uh, videos, uh, obviously, but because again, they could be used for, for, for some uh, um, yeah, uh, dangerous activities. Um, and, and so they are going to try to basically automatically detect somehow whether this was uh, synthetically generated or not. Uh, do you see this as a risk for your activities, like that you could be blocked or, or banned in some way? And, and how can you circumvent this um, to make it sort of proved, certified or, or whatever you can do to, to get more uh, credibility onto, onto your material? Yeah, so we're working with all the social platforms already and they're kind of deep fake teams helping them also identify them. But what they're concerned about is that when you break kind of the original kind of the original intent with the content. So let's say you take a BBC interview and you change the kind of the content of that piece that you're breaking the original meaning. But if you're actually leveraging the software to kind of make a translated message from the CEO or from the from a celebrity, that is the original intent of that content piece, right? So, so, so with our early, with our conversations, that is not like what they're trying to detect. They're only trying to detect when like the original intent is kind of broken of that content piece. All right. Okay. Um, um, I just got a got a quick message into my ear. So apparently we we're already like short in time, and Stefan, I think we could go on like talking uh, for for many more minutes, not even hours, about what <laughs> the next steps would be, like in synthetic media, and uh, what's the ups and downs. I think you, you I think you showed a way uh, that there are way that there are ways to make sure that the content that you're creating is not disrupted. Um, I think it's still a path to go. Uh, uh, happy to discuss in a different format, or may, if people want to reach out to you, I think it's easy to find your contact some, somewhere in the web or reach out to uh, Synthesia. Um, anyways, then, Stefan, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been a big pleasure, also a big pleasure like working with you for the past months, we got to say. Um, and uh, so, uh, Stefan, we, uh, thanks again. And then we will be handing on and going to the next session that uh, Jan, I think you would be kicking off.
So we're going to talk about um, voice recognition, everybody's darling. Uh, I think most of you know about it. Many have actually some sort of voice recognition device or software at home, uh, be it for, for asking Alexa uh, to play some music or asking Siri about the weather. Um, so obviously these can be quite, quite interesting and, and useful and, and also convenient to, to steer some objects or Or, or task that has much, much bigger or additional potential to it, which is in the industrial context, in the factory context, uh, where I think and we think that, that voice recognition, especially speech to intent, what, what Fluent AI is pioneering, uh, can really be a, a game changer in terms of productivity, uh, user friendliness, ergonomics, and, and, and some of the things that we will talk about. So. Um, yeah, Fluent AI is, is a Canadian uh, startup that has uh, recently raised over $5 million. And uh, we're super excited to have uh, Kirsten, Director of Sales and Marketing with us here today. Hi, Kirsten. Hi, Jan. Thank, thank you for having me today. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Our pleasure. So um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about speech to intent, uh, what, what, what this is and, and what makes your technology different from, from other players in the industry. Yeah, so traditional voice technologies, that includes Alexa, it includes Siri, also Google Assistant, they all operate in the cloud using a two-step approach. So first, the user's speech is sent to the cloud, it's transcribed into text, and then that text is analyzed using natural language processing to understand what the user means and return an action. So this, of course, presents issues of user accuracy because the user's voice data is sent to the cloud it also presents accuracy issues. I mean, I know I have, and I'm sure everyone has had that experience of trying to get Alexa or, or Siri or whichever assistant you use to try to understand what you said. And these accuracy issues are even more true when it, it comes to using voice recognition in a noisy environment or for users who speak with an accent that's considered non-native. What Fluent AI has done is we have developed an innovative approach to speech recognition. So instead of going into the cloud, transcribing into speech, we've completely eliminated the need for speech to text transcription and the reliance on the cloud. So instead, we're going directly from speech to intent or acoustic to action, you could also call it. And that's based on the speech sounds alone. So our, our software is able to understand the user's meaning based on the sounds of their speech. This approach, it allows us to work fully offline embedded on a device, and it also gives a few other advantages. So we are able to perform better in noisy environments and offer more multilingual uh, and, and more accent support than traditional cloud-based technologies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, maybe Kirsten, one challenge to that. I mean, voice has been a big topic for years. You mentioned the typical like smart home devices, and that's been like a thing like a couple of years ago and people were having like their issues about data privacy stuff being sent to the cloud uh, now we're talking about like how it can be used to drive operations in manufacturing in many in production lines that's also something we we, we had a look into like we were just discuss, discussing with you and at least from my knowledge like depending on where you are in the world uh, depending on the regulation there are also like very high boundaries and uh, concerns about Fact, workers being monitored, being controlled, and it's different. Like if people count how many times, like you, you, if your performance is being measured in a way, or if someone's listening to you, what you're doing, like finding out what what's your maybe what's your mood. Is that guy like in a good mood? Is he tired? Why is he tired all the time? What a, like that? That just sounds a bit worrisome. Uh, do you have any any uh, answer to these concerns if people are worried? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I agree with you, Lars. I think it's extremely worrisome. It's, uh, and I think it's a central challenge of the tech industry today. Consumers, as you talked about, they're more aware than ever of how their private data is being stored, how it's used in the devices that they interact with every day. So uh, companies and organizations that have factories in terms of consumer and worker privacy, it's an issue that they can't ignore if they want to First off, protect their workers, but also remain competitive in this day and age. Just going back to the, the smart home, the, the consumer space for a second, uh, the industry publication VoiceBot 
they've done an annual survey over the last three years looking at uh, what concerns people have about these technologies and privacy concerns was the single most exponentially growing reason that people were choosing not to buy a smart speaker in particular. Uh, but with Fluent AI, because our software resides fully offline and on the device, there's no cloud connection involved and there's no text transcription, the user's voice data is not stored anywhere, not even on the device. Uh, the approach that we use, it takes the acoustic signals from the user's speech and it then maps them to the desired intent in order to trigger the proper action on the device. All of this happens in real time and those acoustic signals are not stored on the device and they can't be retrieved. So in the consumer space, users' data stays private and protected and the same goes for a factory setting. Your, your worker's data isn't going to be stored anywhere. It's, it's not uh, something to be worried about. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks, uh, thanks for relieving my worries. More about the... <laughs> So it's all good, Lars. Now you can you can use it at home and ditch Alexa. <laughs> <laughs> Send me one. Um, but but talking about factories, where where I think there is no obviously no no solution yet set or as broadly implemented as uh, as some of the big players in the consumer space. But uh, um, so we've seen like advantages. It's noise robust, which is super important, of course, in in, in the factory environment. Uh, it works offline, so it gets our workers counselors. Uh, <laughs> Uh, ease of, of mind uh, and it's quite also robust in terms of the variety of, of languages and, and accents I understood. So um, what do you think are, are use cases and opportunities in, in that industrial aspect or, or surrounding um, that are worth exploring? Where, where do you see the future going there? Mm -hmm. Yes, so and we've seen that industrial automation is becoming more of uh, it's a growing sector for voice recognition. I, I can see companies looking at voice recognition as a valuable technology to help increase manufacturing efficiency, increase time savings on the factory line, which of course translates into cost savings and also improves the factory worker experience. Instead of having to push a bunch of buttons, pull levers, instead you're speaking a voice command on the line in order to trigger an action. So the user experience is, is more seamless. And then the fact that we're noise robust and, and work offline, there are also key advantages in a factory environment, of course. Uh, corporate privacy is just as uh, important of an issue, an issue in protecting that privacy as it is in the home. So it is one of our key segments right now. The others are the smart home and wearable devices. Uh, in the smart home, for example, we're currently working with a customer to voice enable a microwave with the idea that in the future, all the appliances in the home from your oven to your dishwasher, your security camera system, everything can be voice enabled by Fluent AI to give that hands-free convenience, but without the worries of uh, your data being sent to the cloud and, and used. Um, but so that's, that's a huge segment for us. Um, also, because our technology is very small footprint and it works offline, it means we can also be embedded on very small footprint devices. Uh, think of a light switch, for example, or a battery operated device. Same goes in a factory setting. You might have you know, little knobs, little, little switches where our technology can just reside offline and uh, be used to trigger, for example, uh, calling in the case of an emergency, you know, you have a wake word, help, 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 and then that triggers uh, security to then come and help out the worker. Um, so so there, the possibilities for the technology are really endless. Uh, in the wearable space, devices, when you think of wireless earbuds, fitness trackers, those also require a small footprint. And um, think about the environment where those devices are used. Often you're walking or you're jogging outside where there's outdoor noise. Maybe you're up in the mountains or you're camping in a forest, so there's no internet connection. And, and so that off being able to work offline and be noise robust is absolutely key. Mm, interesting. Kirsten, you were just mentioning being offline, but adding on to like, like one trend we definitely see is that factories or like um, production, like even like our workplace at a, at, a, at a desk, even at our homes, but also like manufacturing lines, get more and more digitized, more and more connected in a way. And there are many like digital signals being sent, sent across. Um, and one, one of the big worries in the industry, especially in, in the industrial context is, uh, is about like cyber attacks. Like 
who cares if someone switches off my light at my home? Like that might be weird and it might be, but I might still survive. But like if, if you have like a big shutdown in a factory and you're losing like hours of, of productive work, that's like a huge worry uh, and concern um, uh, to decision makers. Is, are there any, like generally speaking, any, any trends, any um, reactions, answers to that uh, that you can see? And maybe how does it link to, to what you're doing on, on, on the wise level? Mm -hmm. So I think you can think of the digital world as you would the physical world. You know, take being in your home, for example, what do you do to protect yourself? Well, you probably lock the door. Once you're inside your house, what do you do to further your security? You might lock up your valuables in a safe. Maybe you have security cameras around the perimeter of your house. So you can see who's coming. So the question then is, in a digital world, how do you replicate that? Well, in terms of locking the door to your house in a factory, the equivalent would be keeping the factory control system offline on-prem. Uh, how do you secure things further? Well, that's where biometric technology comes in. Uh, so if you look at how do workers get access into the, the factory network, maybe it's a combination of voice ID as well as a fingerprint scan or facial recognition. So it's it's boosting your digital lock to, to make sure the factory is, is as secure as it could be. Um, that being said, I think you can have the most cutting edge technology, but human ingenuity and social engineering, they've often found a way to get around that technology. So uh, humans are really still uh, going to be a challenge. Um, for example, a few years ago in North America, there was a group of hackers who were able to hack into a casino through a connected fish tank. So the fish tank was uh, hooked up to the casino network. It had fancy sensors to regulate temperature and cleanliness of the tank. And the hackers managed to get into that fish application, uh, fish tank application, and then from there move up into other areas of the network and steal data from the casino. Or to give an example of social engineering, if you look at the case of, uh, of Edward Snowden, it was found out after he was caught through an investigation that uh, many of his colleagues at the National Security Agency had actually given him their login info and their passwords simply because he was able to convince them that he needed this info to do his job as a computer systems admin. So when it comes to protecting a digital factory, I think the approach has to be twofold. As I've said, the first, just making sure that digital lock is in place and is as strong as it can be. Uh, and, and also, I think we can't discount the importance of employee training and education. So educating employees, not just on the technology, but on the cybersecurity risks that are involved and, and how to mitigate those risks. Sounds very reasonable um, to me. Um, I, have, I have two more questions. I think we should right? only have one. Uh, looking at the time, we got time for one more question, Jan, but happy to shoot, you go. All right, two, two, two quick questions. Uh, one very quick. So uh, in April this year, actually, uh, Gartner named you as one of their uh, five cool vendors. So question number one is, how cool is that? Answer is so cool. We, it was really an honor to be uh, to be named in that report. And um, it's a huge recognition by Gartner. Awesome. I thought so. Uh, and second question, uh, it's like, seriously, what, what are the future plans for, for Fluent? Just briefly, where, what kind of products uh, and services can we expect in five years from you? Yep. So on our long-term technology roadmap, we're looking to continually innovate to grow our product and uh, offerings in the voice AI space, because overall our mission is to voice enable the world's devices. We want everyone to be understood by their technology regardless of the ac uh, your accent, the language you speak, your environment. So other technologies are going to com come into play uh, in, this, in this vision, and that's uh, voice ID, it's emotion recognition, sound recognition, for example. So these are all possibilities for Fluent AI. In the future, we also see Fluent AI being used in a multimodal capacity, along with other AI technologies, in particular, image recognition and object detection. 
So one of our customers, they have a vision, which we also share of the multimodal smart home, uh, where you walk into your kitchen, for example, you put your coffee in the microwave, you just say reheat, it, it knows that it's a cup of coffee and how much time to put on, uh, on that microwave. You put your bread in the toaster oven and you say start toast and the toaster oven, it already knows who you are from your voice and how you like your toast. So it, it automatically sets the time. So it's a vision of an entire smart home ecosystem that's uh, taking the smart home to the next level. It's understanding who you are um, and really reducing the cognitive load on the user and all the while protecting uh, privacy by keeping everything fully offline and private. We're looking to uh, further explore in our other segments, in particular industrial automation, which I think is still uh, just beginning in terms of having voice recognition be used to its full potential. Uh, and, and also one thing that really has stayed with me over the years is one of our customers once told me that people want their voice recognition technology to be better than human in environments or with accents and language that you may have difficulty understanding the person next to you well voice recognition should understand it perfectly and this is where we're headed with our technology to be better than human and where i think ai technology in, in general is headed uh, and you know by being better than human uh, i think overall hopefully it will improve life for everyone for humanity i don't think these are like really nice words to and to wrap it up um, just again, managing time. Kirsten, it was a pleasure to have you here. Uh, great, in a way, to get you relief of some of the worries you were having. I'm very worried that there might actually be people reheating their coffee in a microwave. I've never heard about that. I'm really shocked. But that's a different topic. We've got to discuss at some other, some other occasion. Um, but Kirsten, thanks again. It was a pleasure. Uh, we will stay in touch. And again, like people uh, in the conference, if, you, if you're interested to learn more, reach out to Kirsten and, and Fluent AI. Uh, to learn and engage with them. Well, there, is. there we are. Hello, hey, everyone. <laughs> hey, Nico. There. Hello. Hi, good to see you again. How's it going? How are you doing? Not too bad. You're, Thank you. You're the last one I'm to good. join us Thank for you. today, but you'll you'll be the, uh, the 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 great end to a great discussion and a great in a way like a one by one panel that we're having today. And let me give you like a quick intro, like to the audience, a quick intro to what uh, Inigo and, and Miro is, is doing. Um, so um, in these new times where like we all uh, have the pleasure to stay at home, there might be many things we really uh, enjoy. It's like not commuting, uh, having more time um, with your family, being more flexible or whatever it might be. But there's also, and we hear that quite often from many colleagues, many things that get lost if, don't, if people do not team up, work together uh, collaboratively in a room, in workshops. Uh, and they're really worried that, especially when it comes to uh, building um, kind of like a, a cultural bond between teams, but also when it comes to being more creative in discussions, there are many things that are being lost. And um, in ego, um, uh, and Miro, you're tackling this issue with like uh, colla online collaboration tools or a tool that you build and selling quite successfully. And we're a big fan of yours. But actually, like, of course, uh, let, we'll want to give you like a quick stage at the beginning for a quick intro from your side and a quick intro what you're doing with Miro to help us with these challenges uh, that we're all facing today. Cool. Yes. Thank you, Lars. And it's a pleasure to be here, first of all. Um, so Miro is an online collaborative whiteboard platform to bring teams together anytime and anywhere and ultimately empower them to create the next big thing. Because back in the days, um, teams traveled across the world to meet each other and collaborate. And we are trying to replicate that experience and bring that into an online fashion. And what makes us different compared to all the other online collaboration tools is that we are bringing the visual aspect back to the meeting. And um, where we are a visual collaboration platform that enables driving continuous innovation 
and improvement across the whole organization. Whether it's your product, product team who's working on the next roadmap or for example, your design team who's mapping out the customer journey for a new product or whatsoever. Cool, thanks. So um, we've actually seen, I mean, we've used Miro before, we've all have, uh, uh, we've, we've been using it in the company as well, like super big fans of it. We've seen some, some, some let's call them risks <laughs> uh, that I would like to talk to you about. Um, and actually most often named uh, risks or challenges with it, with also working remotely, maybe not necessarily always Miro, but um, just remote work is, is we see this sort of a bit of lack of human, human interaction, like what we're used to having in, in, in the regular setting. Um, and with some of the communications issues um, also arises a, actually kind of a, a decrease in productivity. Like I've, I've seen myself like boards, collaboration boards full of like 20, 30 pointers that are all trying to do something. And, and honestly, some of them looked a bit lost to me uh, because there's, there's so much going on uh, in the digital version of this, uh, of this setting that you might not have in the physical one. How, how do you see this and, and how do you want to do you see it as an issue and, and how do you try to, to tackle it in the digital world? Yeah, that's a great question, Ian. Um, so after COVID hit the world, um, suddenly everyone was obliged to work from home. And many organizations, they didn't have the ecosystem to support the situation, right? Um, and that ultimately led to a decrease in both productivity as well as communication issues. Now, after a couple of months, um, you have seen that most of the organizations, they now have some great tools available. So they use, for example, MS Teams or Slack for messaging, maybe Zoom for video conferencing and so forth. Now, what's still missing is that visual aspect. It's like having the possibility to put your creativity on the paper and being able to simultaneously work together on the same thing and on the same project. And I think that's where Miro tries to step in and giving the opportunity where up to 20 people, 400 people, can work together, be in a room and put on the creativity on the whiteboard at the same time. And again, so you, you, you see absolutely no risk in there. So you don't see any way of, because I, what I have experienced is that, that people need to learn how to use it because in some ways it's quite different. It, it, it tries to, to replicate the sort of offline experience that you want to have as close as possible. Uh, also by having some, some audio feed in, 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 in parallel, they should have this exchange. Um, but even if like, imagine you were all standing in front of a whiteboard and everybody's pitching in their ideas at the same time, it's like, it's, it's frantic, it's, it's chaotic. How, how do you educate people to, to use such powerful tools in the right, in the best way? Yeah, that, that's, that's indeed, there is a learning curve, of course. I think that's with every tool at the end of the day. Um, but what we're trying to build within our platform is giving the facilitator the tools to guide a workshop and to guide a session. Because indeed, it can be hectic, but you want to give the control to the expert. You want to give the control to the facilitator and let them decide what somebody can do and what somebody cannot do on the whiteboard. On the other hand, you have to educate your employees as well. So you have to teach them how to use Miro. And how we do that is for example, at the beginning of every session, we do have a funny exercise, like an icebreaker. Like, hey, how do you feel today? Or Let's paint something on Miro just to break the eyes and get the people familiar with the, with the functionalities and with the capabilities of the tool as well. 
I think I like the idea, I mean, of getting used to a new tool, right? So when you think about all the other stuff that we're using, like email, spreadsheets, PowerPoint, especially when it comes to interacting, even like, like uh, uh, video conferencing, there's a learning curve and there are like social rules or etiquettes being developed over time. I mean, and I think that has been has been speeded, speeding up tremendously. Um, maybe Nico, follow, quick follow-up question. Do you think of like creating or like setting up kind of like the, the 10 rules of online whiteboarding? Is, does it set anything that makes sense? Or would you say rather, okay, like the experts, they should be guiding um, and, and, and that's the way to do it. Any, any ideas on that? Um, no, like, yeah, we do have some guidelines, of course. Um, like there's yeah. a, a playbook, there's a workshop. Um, but usually you will see that there are some super users within the company. And if you talk, for example, about agile or about scrum masters, they are usually the experts and they will teach the tool to the rest of the company, to the rest of the organization. Okay. Now, so my, uh, what you have to make sure as, an, as a company, as a platform, is to make sure that the tool is intuitive. It's intuitive enough and that the learning curve is not too steep. Mm. I think that's something that you have to make sure as well. Mm. Maybe, maybe, maybe the good, uh, that's a good um, line or statement to my next question. Like, when I, when I talk to some companies, like young, young companies, startups just did, did so yesterday, uh, they're, some of them are now planning to go full remote, being, meaning that uh, the, they do not have a physical office any longer. Uh, they have like virtual teams all across the globe, hiring people from everywhere. Um, is that something you, you would recommend or you see happening in the future? Like, and you might, you might be seeing it already, like in, in terms of your users and your tracking that you're getting. Is it for everyone or is it just for some people, some companies out there? That's a really good question. Like, would I recommend corporations to go all digital? Um, no, it's my answer. <laughs> like, I think we're all humans, right? Um, we love physical interaction. And I also believe that it's important for our social well-being. Like some of the best ideas, they arise during an informal chat at the coffee machine, for example. Having said that, I do believe in a hybrid model because we should realize that next to the current pandemic, we're also in the middle of a climate change. And this problem is real. And it's already happening for many, many years. And we have to be aware of the fact that there is no need to travel for every little thing. And that's what happened in the past. Like we travel for every meeting across the world, across the globe, um, CO2 emissions, et cetera, et cetera. And we should be able to substantially reduce the number of travel movements. So instead of traveling every month or every week, let's maybe travel every two months or every three months. But if everyone is doing that within the world, we will work on the climate change as well. And I believe that new technology, like new technology will support this change. It's a grand vision. Really didn't expect that coming. Um, Jan, do, do you have one more? I, quick... home today. <laughs> I took a bike to get here, so I didn't do anything <laughs> wrong to the to, to the environment today. Just just for my excuse here. But Jan, like I leave you one one last Good job, quick Lars. question. Good job. <laughs> uh, I make it super quick because I'm I'm interested in in, in the future of digital collaboration. So so what's what are the next steps? What, what is something that Miro can, can support in, or where do you in Ego actually see the future of, of work, digital work? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, where do we digital work? What you see now is this movement. It's this movement where people work remotely, where people work from home. Um, we don't want to remove all the physical meetings again, 
we want to fit into the existing workflows. So indeed, if we're, if we're talking about um, online collaboration, you would like to replicate, you would like to replicate the old way of doing, the old way of working. So indeed, having that feeling that you are together, having a feeling that everyone can bring their opinions, bring their ideas, whenever they want and how they want. And having that online, having that online experience. And whenever we go back to the office, because that will happen, still being able to access all of that. I think that's where we're going. So having the hybrid model, I think that's a, that's a good figure. Mm. Okay, good one. Wonderful. Um, we really, really like a good vision over there. Inigo, thank you so much. Thank you for being with us today.